Symphony, and this is my the end of my 11th season in the orchestra. Well, first of all, Liz, uh, would you mind just telling us a little bit about where you grew up and how you chose the horn? I grew up um, outside of Detroit in a suburb called Plymouth. Yeah, I grew up listening to Detroit Symphony Youth Concerts. That kind of probably got me into music. My mom is a retired middle school band teacher, and I had started on piano at four. I loved piano. At one point I thought I was gonna be a concert pianist until I learned how much work it really, really took. And um, sixth grade came around and my mom said, okay, what do you wanna play? And I said, I wanted to play something hard that had a lot of solos. And so she brought home, I think the tuba, the oboe and the horn. And the tuba was kind of out. It's not really my thing. It was a little big for a sixth grade, you know, petite sixth grade girl. And, um, so I kind of was down between horn and oboe, and I thought I really wanted to play the oboe. I loved the oboe, I loved it, I thought it had a beautiful sound. And my mom, being practical, knew how horrible beginning oboe sounded, and uh, all about the um, intricacies of making your own reeds. You know, I kind of also really liked the horn, and so I kind of went with that and, and fell in love with it pretty quickly. And I think I decided around like ninth grade that I wanted to be a professional horn player, that's what I wanted to do. Well, Liz, I didn't set out with these interviews to be an advertisement for Rice University, but of my four guests now, you're the third to have a music degree from there. What is it about that university that seems to work so well at placing musicians into orchestras? First of all, I think that they really do a great job of hiring amazing teachers, teachers who are really not only amazing players, but amazing teachers. And I think across the board, I think you, you can't really find a weakness among the teachers at the school. They're all just really incredible at what they do. Um, the second reason I think is the orchestra program is so strong. If you were to take a recording of the Shepherd School Orchestra and not tell anyone that it's a school orchestra, I think people would be really, really surprised to find out that it's not a professional orchestra. Um, Larry Rackliffe, the music director, is just is incredible. He's so picky and he will treat you like you're in a professional orchestra. The third reason I think Rice is really great is it's a really small school. So um, my horn studio in particular was never any greater than nine students. And um, the, the smallest year we were six, only six women actually, six, which was really cool. Almost everyone that I was in that studio with is working professionally um, somewhere, which is pretty incredible. And that really goes into the fourth reason, at least in, for the horn studio, um, Bill Vermeulen is really, an incredible teacher. I think it, just the number of his students who are playing professionally is a testament to how great he is at what he does. And he focuses, I think, really well on fundamentals. When you get there, your fundamentals all over the horn have to be in incredible, incredible shape. I think one of my favorite quotes is that whoever wins the audition is the person who hides what they stink at the best on the day of the audition. Not necessarily the best player, but who hides what they're, what they're worst at on the best. I think one thing the school does really well, we practice auditioning. At Rice, we had a seating audition for every single orchestra concert. And um, plus they would have the brass repertoire class would have a mock audition every year for the whole class. So you would go play a mock audition with all the other horn players for the entire brass section, which is a little terrifying to play a mock audition for that many of your peers at one time, um, but I think Bill's in particular, he does a really great job of making it as similar to an actual orchestra audition as possible. There's a proctor, there's a screen, you get a warm up room, you're brought in one at a time. I think just auditioning for your peers at school is so encouraged. Um, doing auditions for other teachers at the school is really encouraged and I think because the school is small, there's so much more ability to do that because it's not always just a horn player who's on your committee. In fact, you're gonna have a string player, a clarinet player, an oboe player, and you'll have all these different people who don't play your instrument on the committee. And so it's really great to get a perspective from not your own studio to before you take an audition. So, you know, you get that kind of feedback. So those are, I know that's like kind of a lengthy answer, but it's, it, it's, it's a complicated answer as to why I think Rice does things so well. Well, you, you kind of alluded to and segued into my next question on auditions. It was a little over 10 years ago now, but what do you remember about your audition here in Kansas City? 
Uh, my audition was back in the Lyric Theater. That was not the greatest of environments. <laughs> I think we're all really happy to be out of the Lyric Theater and into the Kaufman Center. Um, so I remember it was kind of a cold day in October and the warm-up rooms were really, really drafty. And I remember sitting in my warm-up room in like a full fleece jacket trying to stay warm. And I had a cough that I was trying to suppress the whole audition so nobody would knew who I, know who I was and I wouldn't be able to be identified as, as a female or, hey, that person who coughed, that's probably number whatever from the previous round. I remember getting into the finals and there were four of us in the finals and they're all people who are really fantastic players and people I've been kind of like circulating audition, the audition system with and thinking, okay, well, here it goes. These are really great people. So I, you know, who knows if this is going to happen. And then it got narrowed down to just the two of us. And, um, I remember just being surprised and really happy that I, you know, won the audition and, uh, happy to see Michael Gordon's face because he was the one of the only people I knew from the, in the entire world when I got here. Some of our watchers might have seen your video on how to make a hose horn at home. Do you have any other hidden talents that we don't know about? Secret fact, I took voice lessons my senior year of college, actually with Larry Ratcliffe's wife. And before coming to Kansas City, when I lived in LA, I had a job singing in a church choir. So I was actually paid to sing alto for a, a church choir in Los Angeles. Um, I've been doing a lot of baking in quarantine, and um, which I'm sure my kids love. Um, but I've been experimenting lately with uh, ketogenic baking. and um, so like a lot of grain free kind of like lower glycemic index baking, which I've actually been surprised that my kids have kind of taken to. I made, believe it or not, chocolate donuts a week ago with like no grain. And um, I think it was coconut sugar and maple syrup, which are like lower glycemic index than white sugar. And they love them. They were a huge hit. During a normal season, what's it like to balance that schedule with your family when you're performing almost every weekend evening? It can be tricky at times. And my, my kids aren't in a full-time daycare program. I really enjoy getting to spend a lot of time with them at home while they're young. And I couldn't do it without the world's most amazing nanny. So she's like basically like another member of the family now. She's been with us for three years, but um, I think we do, Nathan and I do a lot of what we call high five parenting where he'll walk in the door at six o'clock and, you know, we'll have a seven o'clock, whatever. And, and we'll basically just high five and I'll walk right out the door. So there's a lot of, um, you know, divide and conquer. And we go through our schedules kind of at the beginning of, of the fall. And then again, at the beginning of the spring season and, um, say, okay, you need to be home at this time so that I can leave for work at this time. And, um, and so we managed kind of like the logistics that way, but it, it is tricky to never really get like a full 24 hours as a family, um, like a lot of people do. And it's harder for us to get date nights because we're always working on the weekends. But I think that what does make it special is that when we ever do get to have that time as a family, I think uh, we appreciate it a lot more and we're much more um, cognizant and grateful of how we spend our time together. So like I'm kind of protective of my summer now because it's like the only like decent chunk of time that we really get to be together as a family. Although quarantine too much. Well let's let's move into some rapid fire questions for you um, if you don't mind. Which school would you rather see win an NCAA championship? The University of Michigan or Rice? <laughs> Ooh, but for happiness in my household, Michigan, but, uh, you know, personally, rice is always, you know, where my heart is at, so I even wore my little owl earrings today for that. Which horn concerto would you choose to perform with the symphony? I've always had, the very first horn concerto I ever played was the, the Franz Strauss concerto. I feel like I just always have this, like, special spot in my heart for that concerto in particular, but, um, if I had the time to really, really, really work it up, I think probably the Strauss Second Concerto. All right, here it is. What is your favorite Kansas City barbecue restaurant? Joe's. I'm a Joe's girl. What are you singing at a karaoke session? I don't know. Maybe some Adele. I kind of have like that voice range. Do you have a horn playing idol? I think right now, Sarah Willis is my horn playing idol. She is incredible. She's an amazing low horn player an amazing advocate for arts in her community and for music education and just 
I, yeah, if I could have a beer with anyone right now and talk about horn, it would be Sarah Willis. An orchestra's horn section is unique from other sections in the way it's scored. Talk to us a little bit about what it's like playing specifically second horn and how that typically differs from the other horn parts. Second horn is, I think, traditionally a low horn part. The, so there are, for our viewers who may not know very much about how a horn section works, there are typically like five or six members of a horn section. There's the principal horn who plays, you know, mostly high, a lot of solos, you know, the big job. Um, second horn plays mostly low, third horn is mostly high, and fourth horn is, is mostly low again. So second and fourth are, are pretty exclusively low horn players. And then we also have an associate and assistant who will help out the principal horn um, because his job is quite challenging. Um, second horn is kind of the, I think like the, a little bit of the workhorse of the horn section. It's very rare that you will find a piece that does not have a second horn part to it. Um, a lot of pieces are just two horns or four horns, but um, really love playing low. I like that when I'm done with work, I'm not always tired and that is kind of a nice feeling. And um, I like that I get to kind of support the first horn. And I feel like my job is kind of to take the pitch or whatever the first horn is relaying and then I take it and um, I kind of set the pitch for the horn section or where the chord's gonna be. If I'm off in my intonation, the rest of the horn section doesn't have a prayer of getting it right. So that's a big part of my job. I love that uh, I kind of get to have a few moments to myself, but not enough that um, I'm as terrified as I would be as <laughs> if I was playing principal horn. And there's so many beautiful like duet moments for first and second horn. And I, I really cherish whenever those kind of come around in the repertoire. You mentioned the other members in our horn section. We've had the same five member horn section since the start of the 2012 season when Dave Gamble joined you, Albert, David, and Steve. The only other section in our orchestra that's remained unchanged in that eight season is a single person section, which is timpani. How does that kind of stability help you and the horn section excel together? I think that we all know each other and we know each other's playing so well now that we can you know, almost predict what each other are going to do before the person does it, or at least when we know that a certain piece of repertoire is going to come up, I, you know, I can always expect that Albert and Dave are going to play something and I know exactly how they're going to play it before they do it because of just of our shared history. And I think it's also great because the five of us have been together for so long. We're so close. Um, we're almost like the little family. We've been to each other's weddings. We've been to each other's baptisms and baby showers and you know all these great life events and at least before several of us had really small children um we used to have a horn christmas party every year and get together and do like a white elephant gift exchange and you know drink a lot of beer because we're horn players <laughs> and you know we would have you know a really really good time and it's i think also nice that there are several of us raising young children together right now so it's nice to be able to kind of go through that together and share the challenges of raising small kids while being in the orchestra. What are some works that have just killer second horn parts that you get really excited about playing for selfish reasons? I think the two that came to mind the most are Mahler 9 and uh, Beethoven 7. And Mahler 9 opens, the whole symphony opens with just this beautiful second horn solo. It's one of the only second horn solos. Beethoven 7 shows up much more frequently. I think we've done it three times on subscription in 11 years, but um, I love Beethoven 7. He wrote so many beautiful moments for second horn. Um, there's a little solo in the second movement, and uh, in the third movement, there's a, I don't know if I necessarily call it a solo, but um, there's a part where the second horn's playing by themselves, and you're kind of hanging out in the basement, which is, is kind of, of fun. And then there's a, some really great duets with the first horn. It's just a, a really cool piece to play. And I pretty much love whenever Beethoven comes up because I love the way he writes second horn parts just jump all over the place. And I, I really enjoy that challenge. But I think you get any horn player who's happy when, you know, Beethoven and Mahler and Strauss and, and all those really fun things come up. Although I'm really hoping that maybe when we start some social distancing, distancing concerts that we can really do Schoenberg Chamber Symphonies because I'm dying to play those second horn parts. Well, Liz, I really appreciate you doing this. I think you've, you've, you speak so well on, on what you do and you clearly 
love your job and you're you're fantastic at it and i really appreciate you taking the time here today to to talk to me and that hope our audience feels like they have met you a little bit all right thanks for having me justin i, I appreciate it it's fun to get out and talk to another adult <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.